Nigeria the world over. There will always be few people who will not be happy with peace, and that's where government will take necessary action to ensure that there is peace in each and every square meter in this country. Uh, uh, as much as I would like you to uh, treat those, uh, these questions very decisively, I also uh, like to, that you treat them straight on so that we can... Uh, one more question from you, Mr. Ejofo. Your Excellency, um, from your approaches, uh, you are looking at uh, kinetic and non-kinetic approaches. Can you explain brief, briefly to Nigerians how you intend to achieve these kinetic and non-kinetic approaches? You've talked about that. Yeah. You talked you about specific? it. Yeah. Yeah. About using political solutions and military. Yeah. That's kinetic and non-kinetic. Yeah. So what I'm saying, explain to us briefly how you intend to achieve this. No, I think it's very clear. Of course, I told you we'll carry everybody along. Now I can give you a practical example that most people today are not being carried along by the government. Even at our level, if we see something, we need to say something. But we find it difficult to know who to talk to because many of those are closed. And therefore people, especially the military itself and other security agencies, are missing critical issues or points or information that ordinary, ordinarily would have been very important to them to ensure that there is peace uh, in the country. So we'll take everybody along, and of course the military or the security agencies, plus the intelligence I mentioned, both the artificial and of course the human that is very much available today. Because I believe, based on my personal experiences over the years, that Nigerians are good people. They are ready, they are willing to support government to ensure that it functions well, even under the most difficult circumstances, even under provocations and so on. But unless they are given the opportunity to do so, it becomes very, very difficult uh, uh, to, to pass any information which is critically needed by our security agents uh, to function. Thank you so much. Let's take a question from Mr. Kabiru Adamu. Thank you so much, Mr. Ejiofo. Let's switch over now to Mr. Kabiru Adamu, who is also a security consultant and is the executive director of uh, um, uh, Beacon Consulting. Mr. Kabiru Adamu. Thank you very much. Um, the presidential and vice presidential candidate of the NNPP, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, your Excellency, I have um, three questions, and I'll quickly read through them. It's been argued that two of the major reasons for insecurity in Nigeria are absence of coordination and synergy between the federal and subnational governments, and within the about 27 ministries, departments, and agencies. How do you plan to address this issue in a practical and sustainable manner? that ensures effectiveness and e efficiency. Second question, there is a lack of account accountability within the security sector, where officials whose negligence or other acts of omission or commission are not penalized. You were once a Minister of Defense. What did you do as Minister of Defense to address this challenge? And what would you do if you become uh, if you are elected the president. Right, let's allow him to take these two questions. No, the third one. No, let's take the two questions first, because of time. Uh, okay. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we are very much aware of the issues of the synergy and the issue of coordination. Synergy, there must be synergy to succeed. And that was exactly what we did when I was in the Ministry of Defense. We noted that there are many issues even between the services, three services that we had. And even the ministry itself, the civilian cell, and of course, even worst, the other security agencies, especially like the police. In most cases, there was no understanding and agreements between them. So also, in between the ministry and of course including the services and other institutions like the office 
of the security uh, advisor and many other areas that were very critical in terms of synergy. Now, what we did in Kano is a practical example in the sense that we brought everybody together under the brigade commander in Kano. And I believe it's still the practice now. The police, the, the Air Force, the SSS, the civil defense, and everybody they are working as a team when we were challenged, when we had the issue of Boko Haram at it to speak. And therefore, we came together, worked together as a family. Nobody was in a hurry to tell Abuja that I have succeeded in one area. Because as a chief security officer, I told them clearly that our overall interest, I mean, uh, success is the success we require. Not the success of the CP, not the success of the brigade commander alone, and so on and so forth. So we worked as a team, and we provided all what it takes, including the technology, including the, the, the welfare. In fact, we were feeding the military and all those who are on the streets at that time uh, uh, in Kanu, because, in fact, the feeding, the, the food comes out of the government house. I personally go there from time to time to test it, to make sure that it is good, to make sure that it is healthy, and therefore is distributed. And we took a lot of uh, steps to ensure that whatever welfare is going to the soldiers or the streets or the police and so on were given to them and so on. So we created a very conducive atmosphere for the security to function in Kano. And we, they are motivated and they worked so hard to the extent that at that particular time there was nothing Boko Haram did not do to make Kano its base. Uh, we had to kick them out. And I don't think there is any other person uh, who means bad for the state who is happy to go to Kano even at this moment. So, and of course, there is the issue of uh, uh, coordination, which I think they go together with the, with the synergy. Now, the issue of accountability, it is very critical. Of course, in the security uh, uh, field, it goes up to a certain uh, point. It's not 100%, but it has to be close to that. Of course, there is the issue of penalty. Now, nobody in a country like Nigeria, or any country for that matter, should be over and above the law. One of the issues that we are having, in our opinion today, in Nigeria, is that everything goes. Nobody is punished. 100 people killed, 50 people killed, one person killed. That's the story. A place was broken, so many people escaped. Doesn't matter. And so on and so forth. So there must be the issue of penalties. There must be an issue of reward. If you do the right thing, you give the necessary reward. If you are wrong, you are wrong. So these are some of the things that they are already in a, 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 a manifesto or blueprint. So as, a, as a commander in chief, if, for example, the, the kind of prison break that we saw, what would you have done? Well, you see, in the first place, it must be prevented. Even from the versions, who, official versions we hear, there were so many missing links. We were told that many of them, according to the information, that people were being seen around for a long time. And that's what even happened to Boko Haram. Many of those things started from our own end uh, in Kano. And before you know it, we get, pass out the information and so on. Every time, for many obvious reasons, people are finding it difficult to take the action at the right time. That timing is very critical. And that's what happened in that case. Now, what would have, what would have done was to prevent it, to make sure that it didn't happen. Now, of course, you have to make provision for any uh, 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 security breach to happen for hours in any part of Abuja, this Abuja is most unfortunate. I will tell you that our reaction in Kano at that particular time was not more than 10 minutes within the metropolitan. We provided all the vehicles, we provided all the uh, uh, communications necessary to function uh, effectively, we gave them all what they required. And they were, placed, uh, they were staged at critical positions in Kano. And when we call, maximum at that time, I don't know, maybe it's the same now, 
10 minutes somebody will be there. And up till now, I can tell you from time to time, I test the telephone. We have a situation room in Kano. There was never, even now, if I give you the number, you call them, it won't go off. One, two, three, four, maximum, somebody will pick in Kano. And if you tell them, the, in the local governments, in the city, and so on and so forth, they are there. So the act time to react is very critical. So for them to operate for many hours and then put their people, to drive the vehicle, run away to a known place, it's a, it's a miracle. Somebody under normal circumstance uh, uh, would have accounted for what happened. Let's take a break. I must sincerely thank you, Mr. Kagura. You've provoked a, a very uh, critical answer from and Mr. Ijofo. Thank you so much indeed for those insights. Mr. Undu Uwokolo, yet another security expert is standing by to ask its question. But we will take a break. And when we come back, there are more critical aspects of security in this country. That any chief executive to lead this country must be able to take on. We'll be hearing from Senator Kwan Kunsao and his running mate on their solutions to security. Stay with me. Economy also will take our attention after this break, everyone. Join us again. That you have registered to vote in 2023 general elections to ensure your voice is heard through your vote there are a few more things you need to do one listen for INEX announcements on when distribution of pvcs begin for those who registered this year two go and collect your permanent voters card pvc three check your polling units at www.inecnigeria.org forward slash elections forward slash polling dash unit forward slash for the exact location four come out on election day to vote and protect your vote five remember number one to four we can only protect our democracy when we all vote this message is from the nigeria civil society situation room with support from uk foreign commonwealth and development office fcdo Senator Rabi Wusakwankwasu, presidential candidate of the New Nigeria People's Party, and his running mate, Bishop Isaac Idahosa, on one stage for two hours, telling Nigerians about their agenda and manifesto in the People's Town Hall, an engagement like no other for the choice of who becomes Nigeria's next president. 13th November 2022, 7 p.m., live on Channels TV. First Town Hall is in partnership with Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room and its partners, with support from the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Doing differently to make sure that the north central part of con the country and the northwest part of the country is secured. That is my first question. Would you like him to answer to that? I don't want him to mix up the... Okay. Do, do you want to answer that? I can answer. You see, um, the issue of security, it's not just a matter of police, yes, 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 guns, and so on. You see, for you to have effective security in any country, you have to ensure the security of food. You have to ensure the security of health, education, infrastructure, all sorts of things, even job opportunities. Now, once you do that, you find so many instances and, of course, grudges will go down. And, of course, dialogue is very key. Government must be talking to its people. President must come out regularly, in my opinion, if he can, every week. Talk to the people. Tell him where we came from, where we are, and what we intend to do. And people will be happy, even to see that their president. President and other key government officials are key that people of that country, 
even those friendly countries will be happy to ensure that things are going well. So there are many aspects of security that are key that must be handled very efficiently for you to have a very happy uh, community, very happy country. Now, in the absence uh, uh, of that, of course, many things will happen. And that's when you can have all these things. Most of the things that are happening in some of these parts of the country in the north, in my opinion, are lacking in some of these things. And therefore, you have so many things, so many grudges. At the end of the day, if they are not addressed, some people will take arms against their fellow Nigerians and start killing people, maiming people, taking them for ransom, and all sorts of things. Another key thing is drug. The issue of drugs must be addressed very, very well. Because most of these things are being done under the influence of drugs. And in most cases you find now people are, are not fighting drugs. When I was in Kano, we handled the issue of drugs very effectively. We, we, we formed committees, some under NDLE, some under NAFDAQ, with uh, all the relevant stakeholders, and they were going from one point to the other to ensure that anybody taking dr drugs is being picked. And out of the 26 institutes that we built in, tw in, in four years, one of them was reformatory in Kiru local government. So anybody caught taking drugs will be taken to reformatory for three months with psychologists, with uh, clergy or imams and everybody with the family, at the end of the day, we will take them back to normal. And then all of them without exception were either given work with the government or they were given capital to go and start their businesses. In fact, in that line, we take them to ITF in Kano to train them in various trades, give them capital free of charge to go and start their businesses uh, 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 uh. And most of them now working in government. In Kano, if you go, many of them in very, I don't want to mention places, but many of them were picked in, 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 in motor parks, some along this and that, in dark places, and then they were revived, and now they are leaders in the society. So what is critical is that government has to do its own bit. But for those who would insist in being the bad boys, now, that is where the issue of security agencies would come in and take necessary action to ensure the peace of the society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, quickly, uh, there is another question on my kind of uh, security. Yeah. I'm happy um, not only that you were governor, you were equally a member of the Senate. And I'm sure a lot of Nigerians believe that security vote is not our, in our constitution. So, my question is, most of us think that is unaccountable and has been linked to corruption. So, and however, most states that get this money are using it to either fund or back up the state police commands in their state, as well as fund their own uh, state vigilante services. So my question to you is, if you become the president, what's your view about the security vote? Will you remove it or will you make sure that it becomes a constitutional item? That's one. Second question. Will you, as a president, support the establishment of a second-tier policing in the country, considering the escalating num number of uh, violent incidences in the country? Thank you so much, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Thank you very much. You see, for the eight years I was governor, I have ne never taken one naira on the issue of security votes. Not one naira. It's not even there. And... Uh, I have inherited governments that were taking 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 million naira in a day, seven times, 10 times. In fact, at a stage, we have a record of 12 times because the governor can only approve 10 million naira. So they will take 10, 10 times whatever number they want. And on a day, if the CP or the DG, or the director, SSS, or anybody wants to do anything, we we'll listen to him. He should defend it. And once we are satisfied, anything above 10 million naira, I will take it to the council. And the only thing 
that we did not publish for the eight years I was governor was the money given to the security agents. But we have the records. So security votes, in our own opinion, is a big way of stealing money. Because that's why I have never done it. And if I have an opportunity again, there will never be anything like security vote in the presidency. So um, we have seen cases where a lot of money is being siphoned in the name of a security vote, and nobody can defend it. And in my opinion, I think that should be uh, uh, stopped using whatever means because it's only a good way of taking cash from the Treasury. Now, the issue of uh, second-tier police. Now, if you check our blueprint, you find that uh, we're open, restructuring, very much open, including state police. I think that's the one you are talking about, and so on and so forth. They were part of our own understanding of restructuring. Now, while we believe that we will listen to the people, we will do the right thing, but at the same time, we will follow due process. This is not something that the president will sit in his uh, bedroom and uh, announce the, uh, the, the, the change of constitution to insert the issue of that affects uh, the relevant uh, clauses in the Constitution. So we are ready to, do, uh, to follow due process as long as Nigerians are interested in that. But on the other hand, we believe most of these things coming up are as a result of government failure. Once everything is going well, all these things will die down. If everybody will come and do his normal businesses, without any harassment from anybody. If everybody can go to school, everybody can have something to eat, everybody has hope for tomorrow, I don't think anybody will start talking uh, of, of uh, this system is not working. Now, if there is failure, the implication is that uh, people will not, nobody will want to own it. And then people will start going around and see, okay, what is the fault? Oh, it's the fault of Nigerian police. Oh, it's the fault of Nigerian army. It is structuring. Oh, we are poor and so-so players. We want restructuring. So we are open for restructuring, including the state police and any other thing that somebody or some people believe that it is necessary for the progress of this country. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ndu Wokola, I wish we could say more on the issue of security because it's very important. I think in, the, in our nation's history at the moment, uh, there is a very strong need to fix security. You were talking about community participation and reorientation committees in your manifesto, but we will not have time to go into that. Let's go to the economy. And I already have uh, a leader of the National Association of Nigerian Traders, uh, Ms. Ijoma Anuforo. Uh, she is a leader of the National Association of Nigerian Traders. Hi. Good evening. Yeah. Please go ahead with your question. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Senator um, Kwankwasu. I would like to ask, um, if you're elected president, what would you do about um, the incident budget padding and poor implementation of the budget? And then what would you do about the bloated structure of the civil service? It's inefficiency that has almost drowned the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, madam. Now, um, you see the CPRC you mentioned. I will come in, madam, just one or two minutes. You see, it's very critical. In our manifesto or blueprints that we have here, we mentioned the issue of community participation and orientation committees. And these committees are going to be in all the 8,809 words that we have in this country. The idea of those words, of those uh, committees, came from Kano. In Kano, for the eight years I was governor, we have these committees in all the local governments. Now, what we did with the committee was to fund the committee to make sure that basic things in their communities are being done. 
That is in addition to what the state, federal, and of course the local governments were going to do. So at the end of the day, we had so many benefits. Those CP, they call them CRC in Kano, they were the people who are feeding our own primary schools. They will give them money, they go to the primary, they go to market, buy food items, cook for all the primary schools in their locality. They were the very committee that we used to give two sets of uniform every year to our children in primary school. They were the very committee that we used for security. Everything, any information that is important, they bring it up to the government and so on and so forth. Of course, we encourage everybody to go back to his ward in Kano and help his community because we realize most people have left their villages and towns. They don't want to even hear the name. Maybe their parents are there, maybe they are not there. Now we want to do it at national level. And they are going to handle some of the issues, including selection of those who are to be in the security agencies, uh, of course, including the military. We will use them effectively for many, many things. But what is more important is that we will fund them directly from the federal. It's optional for the state or optional for the local government to give them from their own money. But through uh, legislation, we are going to fund uh, those uh, committees. Now, madam, the issue of party. You see, if you are a president or you are a governor and you keep your eyes away like this, anything is likely going to happen. Even the honest ones will start wondering whether they should help themselves. In Kano, we do budgets at the end of the year and start our budget in January. Every July, June, July, we come again and sit down and review our budget. And we have never sat down in Kano to do budget. We take everybody from director level upwards up to the governor. We go to either Kaduna or Abuja. We sit down with these people. Everybody will stand up. Chief executive will stand up and say, I am going to do so-so and so-so. For example, the Ministry of Works, they will tell us the roads that we completed 100% last year. That one closed. Now, which ones are we starting this year? They will tell us. How can we, can we finish them this year? Yes, put 100%. We can't finish 50%, put 50%. And how many have we started last year and they need completion? How much do we, do, do we need to do that? They will tell us. And if you stand up in that meeting, it's just like this one. If you talk anything, that will make you as a foolish man. Everybody will be laughing at you. So that was why when we started, our budget, current, uh, current expenditure was 70%. Capital expenditure was 30%. Before we left Kano, we swapped it. Capital expenditure in Kano, 70%. Recurrent expenditure, 30%. And our, our percentage performance was about 70, I mean 100%, just over 80%. That's percent. Even that one, we had some issues with the state assembly. After finishing everything, when we talk to them, they will add. But our policy was, okay, when I finish our own, we will do your own. And we have never finished our own 100%. So, you see, the, we never had any issue with budget. And that budget thing is key. I have gone through the budget today and I have gone through the budget as a senator. I have been gone through the budget as member of the House of Reps and so on. I believe that with due diligence with what we have done in Kano, if you apply it here, you don't need more than 50% of the amount of money that I have seen here. Because people are just helping themselves. That's the fact of the matter. And nobody is any, doing anything. We have not seen anybody in this, either in the National Assembly or in any ministry or department or agency being punished for anything. So it's like free for all. People are happy. Even the ones who are sitting on the fence, whether to be uh, corrupt or not to be corrupt, they will be corrupt. They will come to this way because everybody is taking. And let me tell you, the civil servants, you mentioned the issue of civil servants. Civil servants are generally good. But that's where they stop. If you come with an agenda to steal, they will show you from A to Z how to steal money. 
I have been a civil servant myself for 17 years. If you come, and we have seen the civil servants in Kano, I have seen them in the Ministry of Defense. Even in the police uh, affairs when I was uh, supervising the ministry. So it depends on the leadership. They don't want punishment. No civil servant will want to query. They never want to query. They can't sleep with query. So the issue of padding, either in the National Assembly, I mean in the National Assembly, is when there is no due diligence. We have seen situations where people were given percentage of the total uh, money revenue that uh, government is getting, and uh, they don't even know what to do. Is it they are too liquid and so on and so forth? These are things that you have to look. You give ministry, department, or agency just what they need, not what they can they need and what they can take. All right. Thank you. We still have uh, some more uh, economy questions. Let me uh, allow us to listen to Mr. Uh, Dr. Muda Yusuf. Uh, a former uh, head at uh, director at the SCCI, uh, he has his question. L let's listen to him. Your Excellency, the current financial position of the federal government is a major cause for concern. At the last budget presentation, as for budget 2023, projected deficit, fiscal deficit was over 10 trillion naira. The debt position is also not better. Current debt level is about 42 trillion naira. Now, if you win this election, how are you going to manage the finances concern to be able to deliver on your programs without incurring more debt? and ensuring that we have a reduction in fiscal deficit. Because the situation currently is extremely fragile as far as the fiscal situation of the country is concerned. Doctor, I'll give you a moment, uh, breather, we take a break. And when we come back, there are so much more questions on the economy. These are another very important aspect of our lives. And we need to get commitment from those who are running for office, whether they have the capacity to fix the economic problems of this country. We take a break, break everyone. We'll be hearing from Cattle Breeders Association of Nigeria, Manufacturer Association of Nigeria. These are people, major player and key players in the economy of this country. And they'll be asking this question, what are the solutions to our economic challenges in this country? Stay with me, everyone. The People's Town Hall continues right after this break. Now that you have registered to vote in 2023 general elections, to ensure your voice is heard through your vote, there are a few more things you need to do. One, listen for INEX announcements on when distribution of PVCs begin for those who registered this year. Two, go and collect your permanent voter's card, PVC. Three, check your polling unit at www.inecnigeria.org forward slash elections forward slash polling dash unit forward slash for the exact location. Location. Four, come out on election day to vote and protect your vote. Five, remember number one to four. We can only protect our democracy when we all vote. This message is from the Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room with support from UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. Our website, ChannelsTV.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, 
Fire TV, and Roku. Channels Television, Ubiquitous. 2023 elections are crucial. Nigerians are waiting to decide. They want leaders who understand their yearnings. Who will it be? The number one seat awaits the best candidate. And that will be the candidate who can adequately provide solutions to the nation's challenges. We bring the candidates and their running mates to the center stage, one party at a time. Watch out for Channel Television's 2023 Presidential Town Hall Series. The People's Town Hall, live on Channel Television. everyone and thank you so much the audience members and of course our audience on zoom that are watching live and participating in this event of course those of you who are responding via social media thank you so much indeed everyone uh, it's indeed a hybrid com uh, engagement across board thank you so much let's get back to the conversation um, the question from dr muda yusuf on the issue of budget and how you hope to fund it without incurring more um, debt you see in Kano we never had an issue of unbalanced uh, budget because we keep our eyes on whatever is coming and we look at what was necessary or important to be done that uh, that year i am not uh, one of those who are in a hurry to borrow money to do anything. You borrow money when it is extremely necessary and to do things that can generate resources and pay that debt. But we are so lucky in Kanu, and that has always been my belief, that there is so much money in this country. Anybody who says there is no money, either he doesn't know or he wants to be mischievous. But there is enough money to do, to take care of each and every one of us in this country. We have done it in Kano in 1999 to 2003. We met a lot of debt. We paid the debt. After eight years, when I lost election, when I went back, I met debt of hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars. We settled them before I left in 2015. I'm, not to, I'm talking of borrowing money either from bank or from individuals and so on. So we have never borrowed. So I believe that that can be replicated to a very large extent at national level. What is, I will not say I will not borrow, but if there are important things that can pay themselves, not to, 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 to borrow and pay salary, handle the current expenditure and so on, I believe there is even more than enough money in this country to handle that. But if there are areas that are necessary, but what I'm telling you is that we have never borrowed for the eight years I was governor in Kano from any bank or any other person. And I believe... If you become president, you will be inheriting. In now, 2023, a, yeah, now, a very huge debt The situation, debt as we are being told now, is that whatever we are getting as our... <laughs> as our resources, as our money in this country is not even enough to service the debt. I think that's what uh, we have heard. Now, the issue is any responsible government, day one, will sit down with all the people, creditors, and see how they can be rescheduled. There has to be negotiation. You cannot be collecting all your resources and paying interest to the creditors. There has to be arrangement to make sure that uh, you are given a space in, uh, a breathing space so that uh, you can start bringing in the good things that are necessary for the country to move forward. And let me say that the amount of money this country is losing, ranging from the oil money itself, because we are told that our allocation of 2.2 million barrels a day has now gone down to less than 1 million. That shouldn't be acceptable to any government. Under normal circumstances, 
government must take over every square meter uh, in, this, in, this, in this country. So I believe that uh, there are a lot of resources, enough resources to take care of ourselves, and that is exactly where we are going or what we are going to do when we have the opportunity. But where we have to talk to creditors and so on from the beginning, certainly we'll do that so that we can make progress. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I we think can make progress. For, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's time for us to um, listen to... Oh, he wants to say something. Wants to say something. All, right, all right, Bishop, go ahead. Yes. You know, I'm a supporting striker, so... <laughs> when it gets to economy, it affects every facet. We must look at increase in production. Once your production and productivity is impaired, it will affect to leading to waste of time, resources, and energy. Uh, the government must be able to cop and fight corruption headlong. And when corruption is being fought, I'm an actor and a social activist. My question... That's one of the ways to generating uh, and making better the economy. Uh, we should look out for the output of goods and services. Uh, Cob uh, capital flight, whereby is a process where Nigerians siphon our hard-earned money abroad and they engage in deploying the services of our monies abroad. Now, leadership must be found to be absolutely transparent. There must be transparency, probity, and accountability. It's a lifestyle. If a leader is corrupt, it goes down the drain. Nobody is afraid to be corrupt because you have nothing to show or nothing to say. Most of the times, you say what you want to say, but you do something differently. Your body language is enough to help people to, to dive in corruption. Will the government be uh, cutting costs of governance? We'll be cutting costs of governance. We'll make How sure governance is not lucrative. Right now, people do all they want to do to be in governance because no. of what we're going to do is to cut excesses. Uh, curb, uh, contract inflation, engage in youth empowerment, and um, engage in services that will ensure that oil taped will become a thing of the past. Siphoning of government money will become a thing of the past because we're going to deploy what we call digital economy, where there is poverty that cuts across. Now, we are going to ensure that people are involved in what we call skill acquisition. That way we retain our money here. We are going to ensure that there is a common system that check meets. And every person is liable to ensuring that before he gets into governance, proper documentation of who you are now and then who you will be after governance will, must be brought to book. Now, you see... Nigeria will move faster and forward if we don't mind who takes the credit. We're going to deploy brains, brilliant Nigerians within and outside, as in the diaspora, who are going to formulate policies and implement policies that will create an environment for people to really dare to want to invest in this country. Let me allow Mr. Kayode Alonga. He's a representative of the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Let's listen to the question from the Manufacturers Association. Mr. Alonga, thank you, Bishop. Yeah, Your Excellencies, um, currently, as it stands, the manufacturing sector contributes less than 10% to the GDP. And, of course, capacity utilization is also averaging below 50 percent. Now there are a number of factors that are responsible for this. Uh, infrastructural deficits, whether it's rail, road, congestion at the port. We have um, electricity supply shortage and um, countless number of factors that are responsible for the situation as it stands right now. We also have Nigeria being a signatory to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. As it stands right now, there are over 43 parties and 18 signatories, which makes this 
body, the second largest world trade body that has free trade area. As it stands, countries like uh, Egypt, Morocco, Kenya, South Africa seems to be well prepared ahead of Nigeria. Even though we have the largest population, of course, by inference, the largest market, but unfortunately, it appears that we are not prepared for what is coming. In the event that your party forms the next government, what are the quick policy decisions that your government will put in place to protect the manufacturing sector and strengthen it in order to make it more competitive on the continental scene and, of course, enable it to contribute more to the right. GDP. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I believe that uh, all of us are aware of what is happening. Some are even going to the extent of saying that today we are importing toothpick. I believe that things must change if we have to make progress. Of course, there are critical factors that can easily support and help manufacturers in this country or anywhere, any country in this world. When we are talking of the issue of power, today we have seen the power that is being generated, the power that is being transmitted with a lot of losses and at the end of the day we have very little that goes out there and even the cost itself must be competitive we have other infrastructure like the roads the railway you mentioned the issue of water supply and so on and so forth they are not there even the issue of security to transport goods and services from one point to the other is lacking uh, everywhere in this country. Even the issue of taxation, government must look at the issue of taxation very critically. The figure, I think, is about 33%. Now, I think in our uh, blueprint, we are talking of 25%. Uh, it may look like reduction, but we are afraid that because of the very high uh, taxation, one, people are running away from this country. Two, some people are avoiding to pay uh, taxes, and therefore government, at the end of the day, is losing the businesses and therefore getting uh, uh, less tax to the government. So there are many areas that we looked at and to ensure that things are done correctly. The issue uh, of corruption that was being mentioned earlier on is very key. And unless the issue of corruption is, uh, corruption is tackled head on, we'll continue to have problems, not only in the area of uh, 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 manufacturing, but in all other areas. The ease of doing business is another area that government must make sure that it's not too difficult for anybody to set up a business locally or to come from elsewhere to bring in uh, 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 investment. So there are many things, many factors that must be tackled by the government to ensure that people are encouraged locally to set up their businesses. Of course, education on its own is very critical. You need to educate your people to face the challenges of today and that of the future. If you don't have educated people or trained people in particular uh, areas, people like me who have been trained in the technical school and polytechnics, people who would come and make sure that things are done here. We have the young men and women. We have people who have gone all over the world to be educated in all the areas. What they lack is the opportunity to, 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 to practice, to do the right thing. We have our classmates all over the world who were doing very well when I was in the civil service, but when you come, you'll only be lucky to even uh, uh, get a job now, talk less or practice what you have learned uh, over the years. We have to get a way of ensuring that people from elsewhere are coming in to invest uh, in this country. But I know you would, uh, my 
Guys, we want to add. Let, let me allow Bishop because we're bringing entertainment uh, uh, practitioners into um, into into the uh, conversation, and perhaps maybe you have some answers to them. Uh, because if you look at what Nollywood is doing and uh, the music industry is doing in the economy of the, of the country is very great. Let me allow you to uh, listen to the question from Kate Enshaw, one of uh, the brightest Nigerian uh, screen stars. Kate Enshaw, let's look in, uh, listen to, and that of Charles Inoje is another Nollywood actor. Let's listen to their questions. Good day, everyone. My name is Kate Enshaw. My name is Charles Inoje. I am in the creative your quest to be president of Nigeria has seen you leave Good day, everyone. PDP, My name is Keith Henshaw. I'm an actor and a social activist. Uh, where you are My question a, a to Senator Rabbi Musa Konkoso um, is how he intends to, to solve the electricity for the average Nigerian. A household that can, you know, that it's worth its salt will have to get an inverter, solar generator, while still depending on the non-existent or the lack of stable electricity. Um, profits of businesses are going up in smoke because I don't think any business worth is sold operates without having to run a generator 24 hours. And then, of course, this the, goes down to the customers and the amount of money they're paying. So will you be able to solve this electricity conundrum and why Nigerians have not been able to access that despite decades of independence? Thank you. What is she she's from Nollywood? Yeah, she's Nollywood. So, okay. yeah, it's Charles and OJ. Charles. TV industry. Your quest to be president of Nigeria has seen you leave the PDP, a party uh, where you are a, a founding member, and later return to it, a move that many interpret as desperation. Now, against the backdrop of your much vaunted love for country, uh, one cannot but wonder why you have not been able to raise uh, some formidable uh, individual uh, that is capable to uh, take up the responsibility of leading this country at a time uh, such as we have that an energetic, youthful leader is required, seeing that uh, age is no longer on your side. So we are wondering, is it that you just want to answer president? This is a question that many Nigerians are asking. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, those are very critical questions from uh, the Nigerian Hollywood actors there. Thank you very much. Um, each and every Nigerian is concerned about the issue of uh, electricity and uh, energy. If you look at our blueprint, we are very detailed on how to handle the issue of electricity in this country. We have noted and therefore divided or brought in some sections to produce electricity in zones. Um, we are not going to concentrate only on one or two sources of generating electricity in this country. We have a lot of sunshine in the northern part of the country. We have many dams, including Mambila Dam, that should be started and completed within the shortest possible time. And I am happy to say that probably I'm the only governor who initiated and started electricity generation from Tiga and Chalawa Gorge Dams in Kano State. We have almost completed when we are going we left 43 million U.S. dollars in that account for transmission and distribution of that electricity in Kano. We are very, this is just to show you that we are very conscious of the importance of the energy. 
We have many dams. In fact, we have 23 dams in Kano. And our long-term plan is to make sure that each and every dam in Kano was being utilized for electricity generation and irrigation, water supply, and so on and so forth. And we are on that when we left, praying that subsequent governments, when they come, they would continue and make sure that Kano State is self-sufficient in electricity. We have a plan, at least for Kano, on how we could use refuse. Refuse is a very source of energy now, and we have a lot of it in Kano, and therefore places where they have such facilities can easily utilize that for electricity. We have places uh, with wind uh, in many parts of this country. We have areas that we have coal. We have areas that we have gas uh, and so on and so forth. So I believe that uh, all hands must be on deck to make sure that we have multiple sources of electricity for this, uh, for this country. So um, it's something that uh, actually bothers many of us. And we need to even look at the law itself, whereby people, uh, companies, individuals can generate electricity and sell it to the uh, uh, relevant uh, 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 organizations so that we can have as much as possible as we have seen many countries uh, are doing uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this world. Now, the issue of uh, PDP, well, I don't know how much time I have. Sorry, I think I need to manage this one. <laughs> Let me just put it, just leave it like that. Thank you. I don't know how much time I have to tell him the story, but if I can be very brief. I want to say that, uh, yes, I was in PDP, but when we were forming PDP in 1998, we were just uh, trying to kick out the military. When we kicked out the military, we realized that uh, we had issues among ourselves when we were talking of uh, supporting the masses as governors and even as president. Uh, at that time, we had issues with people because some serious ideological uh, differences. For that reason, over uh, some years, in 2013, 14, 15, we had to go to APC. And the gentleman, that's Charles, uh, he didn't even mention the APC. I was in APC believing that we are going to have a progressive party that will solve the uh, problems of this country as we are enumerating here in this hall. Unfortunately, we realized that we are a wrong place again. And along the line, we had to make sure that we get a party, a party that will bring people who believe in our ideology right from the national, state, local governments, and even at what level. And that is exactly what is happening. Now we have people that we believe they are our own. And to the extent that people who are doing the wrong things, on the other hand, will find it extremely uh, difficult uh, to be here. Now, on the issue of age, I wish you are here physically, and uh, I, will inst I will make uh, Shewun our referee, and uh, <laughs> see if you like me and you to go from here to Maitama or somewhere to see who is more fit uh, between me and you or even the younger ones. Now, let me tell you, I am not in a hurry to become president. Otherwise, in 2007, when I was Minister of Defense, when I was advisor to President on Darfur and Somalia, when I was Deputy Speaker of the House of Reps, when I was Governor of Kano four years, when I was so on and so forth, I never thought of becoming President. I said I had an unfinished job in Kano. I had to go back to Kano and contest election and went back, finish my, my, my four years, and then move on. Because at that time there was nothing. Now I am, we are still strong. In fact, much stronger than my, my friends, my colleagues, who I believe are tired. I don't know whether he was referring to me or the other, the other people. So I wish you, uh, Charles, 
I hope to see you when, when, uh, when uh, Sean invites us again. And when you are close to me, you should know that I'm the right person to do this job. If I had this job in 2007, for example, when many of my colleagues, 1999 governors, 2007 were contesting, even when I had more experience in various areas than them, they were contesting to become president. I was not in a hurry to be president, but I believe this is the time. And this is the time, by the grace of God, if I am able to do it now, I have all the experiences. It's just like Kalu. All our achievements people are mentioning are only for second term. What we have done in first term, nobody is talking about it. These over 3,000 to 14 countries all over the world, the universities, the scholarships, everything, people are just talking about second term. If not because I had eight years when I left government, if I continued from 1999 to 2007, I wouldn't have done what I did in Kano. Now, if I was president in 2007, I am very much sure that I wouldn't have done what I will do today because I have seen almost, I have seen it almost all to the extent that I'm just yearning to get the job and things will go the way it should, they should go. I, I would take, all right, that's a minute, yeah. Manufacturing, you see, we will encourage Nigerians to consume what we produce and produce what we consume. Then we encourage for us to patronize made in Nigerian goods. And with that, it will better our economy. Concerning my principal, my mentor, a man of political sagacity, this man has all that it takes to take Nigeria to the promised land. Voting for him is voting for our future, our children, and our great-grandchildren. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to take just very quick. I will give you a very difficult task. Because we have education, we have health, we have questions of inclusion, and we don't have too much time. When you become president, if you become president, <laughs> if you become president, you may not have a lot of time. So I will give you a very quick test within the few minutes that we have, whether or not you can quickly tackle some of these uh, uh, questions that are coming. We have a member of the Cattle Breeders Association, and we also have Celestine Okudili, uh, one of our partners from uh, Action Aid. Quickly, let me get your question, Mr. Yaya Isa, who is a member of the Cattle Breeders Association. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, Distinguished Senator Musa Konkoso, uh, alias Konkosia. Uh, I want to go straight to the point. I am representing the Cattle Breeders Association of Nigeria, who of course speak on a very important sector of this economics. That is the livestock. Livestock is combined in the agri department. Uh, at this point of time, we are strongly of the opinion, for the benefit of all, the fact that agri is the sole source of our economy that we rely on it today, tomorrow, and next tomorrow. And for us to pay much attention and give it the best so that we can produce what we export, we produce domestically, we are of the opinion that that ministry could be divided into two. So that at the end of the day, we are talking of having a ministry of livestock and fisheries. Question. Yes, is the question we want them to. Is the question I'm coming? Is the question yeah, I'm no, coming now? The question yeah. is that we are of the opinions that any government that comes on board should think of creating ministry of life of livestock and fisheries, as it implies in our sister state within the African subregions and beyond. What will it be your take in this regard? Then, oh, oh, no, we can only want, take one more. Let's ask Celestine one question, Celestine, in the area of economy. Please, shoot. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. So, my question is simple. Uh, today in Nigeria, a loaf of bread is about 800 to 1,000, depending on where we're buying it. And these are attributable to growing inflation, which is about 23% now. Unemployment is also at 33.3%. So on concrete terms, if we assume office, God willing, next year, 
How are you going to address this, giving us yearly milestones? Thank you. Thank you. If you can quickly uh, tackle those questions in two minutes, mm. please. Last job opportunities. That's, <laughs> yeah, they, from the cattle breeders and Jobs. from Celestia. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, um, Ministry of uh, dividing the ministry into two, Ministry of Agriculture. Now, I think I shouldn't be in a hurry to make comment on this because what we have today in the Treasury is very uh, frightening. And uh, these are things that really require a lot of study because as the vice presidential candidate mentioned, that we have to do everything under the sun to save money in terms of running government. We cannot afford to waste too much resources under our circumstance now in terms of creating uh, our ministries. In fact, we believe that uh, there are some even agencies that, uh, sh I mean, government should look at uh, very, very critically. But on the other hand, we are very conversant with issues that affect the livestock uh, 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 industry uh, in this country. We have many issues. So many people came to me as governor. Even now, people are coming on the issue of multiple taxation. Somebody buying a kettle from uh, 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 Maiduguri, before you take it to Lagos or you take it to any part of the south, it takes a lot of money. You spend a lot of money, people exploiting uh, 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 these uh, businessmen uh, on the road and so on and so forth. So I think there are many areas uh, if you look at our blueprint where we will encourage uh, cattle breeders and of course all other people who are handling the issue of livestock. Now the issue of uh, jobs I think that's the, uh, what the last month the price has gone so much up and yes. that is perhaps one of uh, the food that most Nigerians eat, what would you do? Inflation, basically. Yes. You see, there are many things that can be done. It's just one, it's not one, it's not two, it's not three things. It's a combination of many things that we will do. Ranging from the issue of corruption today, where people are taking or getting easy money, they go and buy dollar at whatever price, it's like they are happy to buy it at any uh, price. Now, the issue of job opportunities. Now, no matter how little the price is, if you don't have that money, it becomes more difficult for you. Our plan is to create as many jobs as possible. Our plan is to ensure that uh, activities are created for every young man and woman. Those who are going to schools will go to schools. Those who have, uh, are ready uh, and trained to do certain jobs, they will continue to do it. We establish technical schools and vocational schools and so on and so forth, like we did in Kano. We created, in this my second term, four cities uh, uh, in Kano State. And to build four cities, it require a lot of things. So many young men and women and businessmen who have been engaged in ensuring that uh, uh, people have got something uh, to do. So the issue of job creation is will we'll handle it in multiple ways to ensure that uh, all the young men and women, those who are willing to work, of course, we give them opportunity to work. All right. There is a critical part of this conversation. You may sit if you will, uh, going forward. Uh, the president of ASU is in the room, so we're going into education, health, and issues of inclusion. These are very critical part of this engagement today. Ben uh, Ugo, uh, Ugoke is a lecturer and a member of ASU. Hi, Ben. Uh, is it about ASU strike and how to permanently solve it or about the education it's system in Nigeria? Education ben. System. It's about the education system. Your Excellency, uh, we're wondering that considering the incessant face offs between the federal government of Nigeria and tertiary institutions based unions over poor funding, what percentage of the annual budget? will your government allocate to education if elected president? And what are your plans for education, especially the university education system? Thank you. Now, thank you very much. 
You see, for those who have in budget and governance generally, the, we, don't, we are not in a hurry to mention percentage. But all what we can say is that our government, by the grace of God, will finance our primary uh, responsibilities. And of course, one of them is the issue of education. Now, I don't know the position you are holding in ASU, but ordinarily, those who are in the field of education in this country, ordinarily they should start by acknowledging my achievements in Kano. We have done so much to the extent that even the branch, Kano ASU branch in Kano, we are not going to uh, strikes when it was called at the national level because all what they had wanted uh, were being properly addressed by our government. Now, another thing is that um, the, our program, the blueprint that we have, has properly addressed all the concerns of ASU. We have made it very clear in our blueprint that we will not be in a hurry to create additional institutions or tertiary institutions. What we will start with day one is to ensure the improvement, the expansion of all the tertiary institutions that we have in this country, including the equipment necessary, including the quality uh, teachers that we have across the country, and even our brothers and sisters that are in diaspora. So we have a comprehensive arrangement in our manifesto to make sure that uh, ASU in particular, uh, their concerns are properly addressed. And that was exactly what we did uh, in Kano. And uh, I am happy to say that uh, most of the uh, young men and women of Kano residents that we sent abroad between 2011 to 2015, over 3,000 of them are all back. Many of them are in Nigeria universities, some are there outside the country, and so on and so forth. In fact, some are already uh, leaders in ASU itself. So um, we established two universities. Uh, they are one of the best universities that we have today in this country, and so on and so forth. So ours, we see education as number one on our agenda. There is a young girl, uh, which we have a recorded question from her, and she's very concerned about what is happening on the street of Nigeria each time she's going to school. She is Chimamanda Azuike. Let's listen to her. She says she's bothered about um, some of the out-of-school children. Each time she's going to school, she sees them on the street, and there will be, uh, the question is, what would you do? Let's listen to Chimamanda Azuike. My name is Chimamanda Azuike, and I'm in year five. Every morning on my way to school, I see many children my age and those younger than me chasing vehicles, begging for money. As president, what would you do to reduce or completely eliminate out-of-school children in Nigeria so they can become valuable contributors to our society? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I'll give you a copy of my of the blueprint to send to her. Because, you see, we have clearly addressed the issue of out-of-school children. In fact, there are about 20 million. And we made it clear that we are going to build 500,000 classrooms across the country meaning that every child in this country should go to school. And let me also tell, I mean, tell her that when I was governor in Kano, there was no such thing, no child in Kano. Kano, when I say Kano, I mean residents. We don't see uh, uh, um, indigenous. We provided adequate classrooms, adequate teachers, adequate uh, teaching and learning materials, everything. There was no almajiri. In fact, it's a law 
during at our time and it's still there that nobody should send his child to the sort of almajiri that she's talking about every child must go to school so it's not something for uh, new to me that and it's very easy if we could do it in kano kano is a good fraction of nigeria if we could do it with our, our resources without resorting to borrow anything and education during our time was free primary secondary and tertiary level and even those who are going to universities all over the world over 3000 of them not only the two universities that we established we also selected uh, uh, private universities i told you the other time we had we sent 200, uh, 412 to alkalam university private university we had sent 300 to uh, 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 ibnidion 300 to bells university 200 to crescent university because of the cost of abt we sent only 25 in, in, in to my right. degree. Let me, because there is the nuns PRO here, uh, who is uh, uh, Mr. Giwa Temitokwe, on still on the issue of the education, which I'd like you to. Uh, Temitokwe, hi. So, yeah, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, your Excellency, there's no doubt that during your time as the governor of Kano State, you did very well, excellently well, in the education sector of the states. So, our fathers and mothers know that education is the bedrock of any nation, and education is a right, not a privilege. As you can see, right now, during the INEC um, um, evaluation of the register, um, voters, um, register for voters, we have 40% of students, not youth alone, students that register this year. And so you can know that we students are ready to vote in our next president. And we are very, very, very serious about this. We want to know the president, we want to know the next president that we are voting for. That's one. Two is that Udai M does our own, uh, on our own platform. But right now, we are evaluating all the president shares and aspirants at the moment. Sir, so, um, the ASU rep asked you a question earlier on about the percentage of the, of the education sector. Like, how do you want to do your own when you get there 20, after the 2023 election, after winning the election? That was the percentage. We all know that um, UNESCO be benchmark is 26% of budgetary allocations. Sir, so, right now, during the um, Around last month, we are on the streets because we are outside. We are outside our campuses for a good eight months, and there's no proper education. There's no proper funding of education. We are not happy about that, right. sir. Are you telling us, sorry, sir? Are you telling us that you two will get there and just do what you want, any, any, you want the way you like it? Right. We want to know now the percentage you are going to. Give us when you get there right, to the office. You. And two is that, sir. Please, sir. Please. It's very important. Education is, see, education is very important, sir. I'm giving you a very good opportunity because we have a lot of things to cover. Thank you, Tomitaka, please. All right. Can we, can you deal with that? I think he's asking the same question. You see, from my own experience in government, it is wrong for anybody to come out and say i'm giving you so so percentage you don't even know the money so you cannot talk of this percentage but what i can assure you is that we are going to have enough resources to fund education in this country not only we will do our own we will work together with the state governments and local governments to make sure that each and every child in this country has given the opportunity to go to school, those who have finished primary school should have a position or a opportunity to go to secondary and then from secondary to the tertiary. And that's exactly what we did. In my last two years in Kano, we were even looking for Kano, not indigenous, residents of Kano to go to university and polytechnics and other tertiary institutions. We couldn't get enough because all of them were mobilized into other institutions, including universities that we selected. We selected Al-Kalam University, private university, 
we selected uh, Maiduguri University, we selected Ahmad Bella University, and uh, 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 Maiduguri University. These four universities, we built 300-bed hostel free of charge, just to encourage them to admit our people, our, our children. So, you see, the issue of education, be at home, we know what we are talking about. We have the necessary experience to handle the issue of education. I think other sectors should be, uh, should, uh, the ones that should be asking me questions, not uh, area of education. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we need to, uh, we, 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 just qu quickly, one sir. It makes it so explicitly simple for them to enroll into tertiary education because NACO, GCE, JAM will be free. And again, the matric examination results for JAM has a lifespan of four years. Thank you so much. Let's get uh, some uh, comment quickly on the issue of health. Um, the president of the Nigerian Medical Association, Dr. Uche Ojenma, is uh, on standby. Hi, Doc. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Your Excellency, I pray you do not take health to the back burner like it's been done here today when the opportunity will be one second to discuss it. But to progress, uh, everything else we have been discussing depends on good health and good education. So let's understand that this is very important and should be taken first. Now, you, are, you must have been following the discourse about the progressive loss of human resource for health, which is commonly called brain drain, and the indices, index effect on our health indices. I'm sure you also are aware that our president returned today after 16 days away on medical tourism. Your Excellency, if you become the president of Nigeria, what will you do, not just to stop the brain drain, but reverse it to brain gain? And then what will be your plan for medical tourism? Will you also go? Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you so much, Rock. I appreciate it. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. You see, the failure that we have today, the one we are saying we are going to correct, affects all sectors, including the health. And I'm happy to say that our package starts right from education, like we have done in Kano. In Kano State, we built institutions, five institutions in four years under the Ministry of Health. Two nursing schools, two uh, midwifery, and health technology, plus um, um, medical college. And we sent hundreds of young men and women abroad in addition to the scholarships in all the institutions that we could get scholar, I mean, admission in this country. We encourage girl-child education. And even at that level of medicine, in fact, there are one set out of over these 3,000, 300 ladies, I mean, out of 300 people will send to do medicine in one go. Only 45 were men. All the remaining were female that we sent abroad to go and uh, uh, study uh, medicine. Now, we improved all our general hospitals in Kano. In fact, I visited America. We have some uh, institutions that we are giving free uh, equipment and, uh, and so on to African countries, especially in Nigeria, all what we are paying was just the issue of uh, transportation. So we brought as many, we equipped our hospitals uh, and, of course, our schools and so on in all the areas. So a lot has been done in the area of education. And I believe there is a lot that can be done uh, again, especially in this country. Now, what we are trying to do now is comprehensive, including the area of health, and I want to assure you that not only me, even you, after a little time in government, 
you will be very happy to stay in Nigeria in our hospitals because we'll do everything it takes, ranging from manpower to all the necessary equipment to encouraging people in private uh, 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 universities so you to make sure abroad for medical treatment. If you, I will if do you are everything under the sun, not to go to anywhere for any medication. Now, look, I will tell you, I will tell you, you see, many people don't understand. We have been to these hospitals, taking our friends, escorting them, going to these medical students, uh, seeing what they were doing. We have seen all the equipment. I have not seen one equipment that Nigeria cannot purchase. One I, can, I couldn't see. So they are not even too much different from what we have in our hospitals. All what we require, of course, to me, is even unwise if I am president or in position not to go abroad, to go there. Because you can bring everybody. Professionals are everywhere, just like our own are going out. You can as well bring other people to come into Nigeria and take care of you in your bedroom or in the clinic or anywhere. You don't have to go there. And let me, let me say that uh, we tried as much as possible. Even this school, there are some bottlenecks in, in your sector, in your area, that we have noted. Many of our students that came, they had to go for examination, which is okay, but they were trained in these countries that our leaders are in a hurry to go. But when they come here, they have to pass that exam, which is okay, let them pass the exam. But the point is that uh, many of them cannot get fixed in a, uh, is it housemanship? I have a daughter. She was the best some years ago in Bayer University. She had to come and beg me to talk to the chief medical director to go. I said, but you are the best. How could I do? I have to call the chief medical director. She said, you have to. I invited one of those I know. He said, it's true. You finish medicine. You cannot go to uh, uh, right away, go to do and do your housemanship and so on and so forth. These are some of the bottlenecks. Right. Even in the, in the nursing, we don't have teachers. We don't have enough teachers. What we did in Kano, because we are in a hurry to have teachers in the Ministry of, the Ministry of Health, we had to select 50 nurses and send them to a university in Egypt and bring in some lecturers to man these our five schools, pending the time these five, 50, finish and come back to manage our institutions. Now, these uh, uh, Arabs came and taught our students. And the thing went so well that the first exam, our national students were the best in the country when right. they had their, their, yeah. their, their exam. Thank you so much. So, we need to move to inclusion. These are another part of, and nobody in this country, just a moment, sir, uh, can be left behind. This is very important in their own nation. I have Mr. Jackie Pelle, uh, who is the leader of uh, uh, the Abino Foundation. Uh, Mr. Pelle, it's good to see you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, my question is direct and sharp. You have made reference or references to your blueprint, which a friend of mine sent to me a while ago. And I took time to look at your blueprint. Mr. Your Excellency, are you aware that your blueprint did not say anything about persons with disability? And would you look me in the eyes and said that you will do an addendum to include persons with disability in your blueprint. Secondly, would you look me in the eyes and the generality of Nigerians watching today and make a commitment, and I'll take it as a social contract, that in your cabinet you will have at least one minister who is a person with disability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because there are women in the room also who have <laughs> some grievances. <laughs> and, please go ahead. Just a minute to um, answer that what, question. What's we his need name to again? I mean, Jack Capelle. Jack, Jack Pelle. Yeah, I met you many times. Um, on a lighter mood, I'm beginning to wonder whether there is uh, anybody today in this country who is not disabled. Because uh, you find uh, everybody, if you cannot eat, I am not disabled. Anyway, 
on a more serious note, I want to say you read our our blueprint. No, it's there. It's I, not. I, I just read it. Okay. It's not. Now, I, I will ask somebody to show you after this uh, where we mentioned. But the point is that, uh, you see, we believe, especially in our party, the NNPP, that we are the, being sponsored by the masses of this country. People that you call the needy. And they covered all those areas you are talking about. The very old, the very young, people with disability and so on. People who require help. This, as politicians, that is our constituency. And you can be rest assured that we are ready at any given time T to do whatever it takes to help this needy. And that is our strength. Majority of this country, um, people of, in this country, require a lot of support in all these areas we are talking about, including the uh, people living with dis disability. Now, if it is a contract, let us have it that by the grace of God, all right. if we have it, you will get, let me say, at least one in the cabinet. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. I have some very vibrant women in the room. I have Ms. Ebere uh, Ifendu and Ms. Faith Nwadishi uh, from Pearl. Uh, Ms. Ebere, oh, great. So let's shoot. I'll take your two questions so that you can answer them. Ms. Ebere, go ahead, please. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Your Excellency, good evening. I don't know if you are aware that the percentage of women in governments is abysmally low. With about 15 states without any woman in the state yeah. assembly, including Kano states. Sir, you have spoken so well about your achievements in, uh, in education, health, and the rest. And I want to know, the time you were governor of uh, Kano State, what did you do to include women? And presently, what are you going to do if you become the president of Nigeria to ensure we have an increase in women's um, representation? Right. Also, um, Just, I need to take one <laughs> so that I can allow Ms. Faith to also ask a question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. My name is Faith Nwadishi. I represent the civil society. I used to be on the board of the international EITI. My question has to do with the economy. Um, we know that we have four refineries in Nigeria with a nameplate of 445,000 barrels per day. But in recent times, these refineries have produced zero barrels per day. And we know also that the cost of fuel subsidy has risen to over 900% on a monthly basis. What, sir, will you do differently in addressing the oil subsidy question? Because right now, as we speak, people are on the streets buying petrol at 500 naira a barrel, I mean a litre. People don't go to work. People sleep at the filling stations. And yet, we are a giant oil-producing country. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Very <clears throat> task. Those are your final questions, and you have just a minute to answer. Okay. <laughs> um, women, you see, like I said, the, our biggest constituency are youth and women, especially in areas that people know us very well. I can say in northern Nigeria today. Now, we handle the issue of women as a package based on my personal experience. When I was governor in 1999, even in 2011 in Kano to 2015, we wanted to make appointment, but definitely we need people who can handle that appointment to the extent that we had to go to university to, that's, that's what is happening in our own part of the country. Maybe it's different, but I'm telling you the reality of what happened in Kano. We had to go to university and ask the vice chancellor or somebody to recommend something. So what we did was to educate, that's the first thing. And secondly, even encourage them to go to tertiary institutions, not only in Nigeria, even abroad. 
And this is the point to thank the husbands, the parents of those young men who were able to take those opportunities. Now I can tell you our situation has changed in Kano based on our own efforts, based on what we have done to make sure that women are carried along. But I'm happy to say now we have many of them that are very much interested in joining the polling. In fact, they are part and parcel of us. With some of them are even holding positions All in right. the party and, uh, of course, in the campaigns. Now, we have time the, again. We are totally out of time. Okay. <laughs> but here is a charter of the man to you. But I didn't which, answer. I have no problem. Unfortunately, we don't have all okay. time to, to, uh, uh, to left again. There is a charter of the man here from the civil society organization, which will be presented to you. And maybe you can sign up to it after this. But I must sincerely thank you and your vice presidential candidate. Thank you so much indeed. This is the first in the series. I must thank NNPP and our partners tonight for partnering with us on this very, very important occasion. Thank you so much indeed, everyone. I'll see you again next time when we take up yet another political party with their flag bearers. Thank you so much, Nigerian. You know your voice counts until that election. When you make that decision, it's bye for me. Bye-bye. And welcome to a new edition of Eco Africa, DW's environmental magazine. My name is Sandra Twinobio, and today we're going to look at how the sports world is starting to champion environmental causes. That's right, we can all do something to help curb climate change and preserve nature. My name is Chris Alems, great to have you with us. This time we'll be looking at. How trash left by tourists is frustrating islanders in Senegal. How activists in Ivory Coast are tackling waste and global warming. And how a traditional irrigation system can save farmers in Tunisia from suffering water shortages. Most of us tend not to associate sports with a drive to beat the climate crisis. But why not? It's all about teamwork, isn't it? The initiative Sports for Future allows athletes and fans to join together to support global environmental projects. How does it work? Let's take a closer look at one German-Nigerian initiative. Soccer brings people together, even across continents. The students of Northern Anang Secondary School in Nigeria have linked up with professional footballers in Germany to help the environment. Climate change is here with us. 